You're going to ask them to rub them together, make sure none of the ink transfers, make sure these aren't stickers. You're not flashing this, obviously. Tell them to make sure those aren't stickers, not uh, two cards stuck together, this and that. Um, when I finally take the card from this person and gesturing to the person with the blank card saying, and the backs are the same also. That gives you an excuse to take the card and get ready for your um, double card turnovers. And the backs are the same. And they agree I put this down. And I act as if I lost my train of thought for a moment. I say, um, as a matter of fact, hold your hand out flat. And then uh, I rest it on their hand. I ask them to place their hand on top. I then take the card from the other person. This would be another person. ask them to place their hand on top. As I don't, I don't know who said it, but um, you have everyone put as many hands as on there. And it gets everyone involved in a simple card trick. I don't remember who said it, but... Um, yeah, so are you getting shorter? I think you are. But, uh, yes. So as they're doing that also, and I say keep putting your hands, put your hand on the eight of hearts, emphasizing the eight of hearts. I keep this in view. As I gesture someone over here, I do one more card turnover. There you go. There's your second time. So I'm, and as they're just doing that, I just kind of come over and I show the blank card. I say, now there's no way I can get to the card. However, <laughs> you are getting shorter. However, I'm going to try and make the ink. The red ink melt up. And it's great if you have one solid colored card, not like a picture card. You know, you say I have all the mixed inks. I just say the red ink will melt up off the card through your hands and reprint on the blank card. If it's a spot card, I just do that. And I just turn it over. And what I like about this handling is it distances the magic away from the deck. I put that down. I just rest it on top of their hands. I snap. And I just bring this up almost as if it's peeled off, like the back of their hand, like I bend it a little, show it. I then t say, the ink melts up, that can only mean your card's now blank. Go ahead, take a look. <laughs> and, and they show that. Now, I let that person hold their card, and I hand this card to the other person who was originally examining the blank card. There you go. Because now, it seems like they're examining the same cards now, that this person's examining... That card, which was an eight of hearts and was printed, but is now blank, and this person is examining what was a blank card and is now a printed card. This is a very humbly named effect. The coolest ace trick in the world. Very humble title. But when you see it, you'll realize why I called it such. Uh, the effect is simple. Um, now, I'm not going to be the guy to tell you... Uh, I invented the packet trick where you turn aces into kings, all right? I mean, that's an old idea, obviously. Um, there's, I think, Daryl and um, Darwin Ortiz have got tricks like this. I mean, everybody's got stuff out there like that. This is just my handling on um, uh, what I think is just a cool idea, you know? Um, the start of the setup here is you've got four kings on the top of the deck, and then you have four aces. I will often tell them to examine the aces, just that's how I get my break. I get a four card break, pinky break here, and I ask them, what's your favorite ace? And they will say, whatever, let's say they say clubs, okay? I have little silly lines I use with the other ones that they don't pick. I say, uh, oh, so you're not a lay person, they usually pick uh, a spades. Now, if I'm performing for lay people, of course, I wouldn't say you're not a lay person. I would probably say, oh, you're not much like into power, you know, this is the power ace. Now, I'm just going to pull the card off. Pivot it around and keep a thumb break here, and I'll display it. Okay. Same thing with the next one. I say, oh, you didn't pick diamonds, so you're not a rich man, or you're not into money. And I do that same thing. I'm still keeping a break there. Finally, the hearts. I say, oh, and you're not a romantic. And then now this next one, I'm going to drop off this packet here on the deck as I take that ace and pivot it around. Okay. So now what I've done, I just table the deck. What I've done is switched in the four kings and an ace, or, and I kept the ace. This is their favorite ace. But now I've got one extra card and none of them are aces except for the first one. Now I tell them I'm going to do a memory test with them and I set it up. Uh, what I need to, what, the position I need to be in is I need that club because it matches that ace. I need that king right there. Okay. Sometimes you'll get lucky and it'll land there. Other times you're not so lucky. So the way I do this, I square it up and of course they can't see this, but I have it up here like this as I'm doing it. But what I'm doing is I'm getting a, a I'm sliding over this ace and I look at this first king here. If that matches what I want, great. If it doesn't, I just move it to the back. And I keep moving the cards to the back till the one that I want is right there. 
That's it. I square up the packet, and then I get a double here. So this is the king of clubs and the ace of clubs. I bring it up like so, and all I'm doing is lining up the cards like this. Now, here comes the fun part. Um, if you cover these up, and I tell them I'm going to test your memory, I'm going to give you a quick flash of the four cards and four aces. Make sure you say aces, just kind of to sell the idea. I'm going to give you a quick flash of the aces. I lift my thumb up a little bit, just enough so that I do expose part of the bottom of the K, because it looks like an A. Um, this is actually similar to an idea that David Regal uses in a, an effect called uh, For Marlowe. He uses the kind of the top curl of the two to look like a queen. Same kind of idea. Um, anyway, so you take this and you roll it up and you say, great, did you get a peek at the cards there? What, are, what order the aces are in? Quickly turn it over and then you'd say, I'm going to test your memory. Now, I ask them what's on the bottom and then they say, oh, what's the ace of clubs? Often they won't remember, it's kind of funny. Um, but I'll display it and then as I'm going to put it back apparently on the bottom, I'll just buckle the bottom card and it goes right on top of that. All right, right there. Oops. And then when I say what's on top, I'm just doing a block pushover. So pushing all the cards over except for the bottom one. It's a big block here. So I do a block pushover and I say the ace is on top. And then I set it on the table and they go, holy cow, how'd you get it on the table? Well, anyway, sorry, I had a moment of spasm there. Anyway, uh, now I do it again. Same thing. Ace of clubs. And I deal it down. Ace of clubs. Now this time you've got three cards here. You've got to be careful. All right. When you turn this over, make sure you don't reveal that. Turn it over. Set it down carefully. Now you've got two cards here. You should be able to just show it as an ace, but you can't. So I lay it down. And then I say, you remember what the last one was, right? Ace of clubs. Now that display is kind of a variation of a Marlowe thing, I think it's called the nerve count or something like that. Um, anyway, then I go from that to a frustration count, John Hammond's frustration count. So we go here, and I say, now you're thinking that you saw four aces, right? A four ace of clubs, right? This is a double here, okay? I load that right underneath the top card. That sets me up perfectly for the Escanio spread I'm about to do in a second. So now, apparently they've seen the Ace of Clubs four times using a couple different displays, but now the kicker and the reason that you set that king where you did a minute ago, when you turn this over it's going to be the king of clubs. And I say you did see a king, a club, but you didn't see an ace, you saw a king. Then you just scan your spread, you pull the bottom card out, pull the top card out, and pull the other bottom card out, and you're left with a double right here. And that's hiding your ace. So, scan your spread, and then I just, the deck would kind of be in, in the performing area. And I say, that's one king. I'm holding a double. I just lay it down. That's two. And this is very free at this point because the double, the dirty work's down there. And we all know magic has lots of dirty work. So, and that's it. I display the cards one at a time, showing four This is a, a neat little thing. Um, yeah, it's something I used to do a long time ago. I don't do it much anymore, but I think it's got some real funkiness. The idea that you're having objects rather than just two coins change places, you're having kind of two quantities, a single changing places with two loose coins, like two coins and one coin, they're changing back and forth. Um, there is something to be said for the idea that, and I did play with it for a while, of using one English penny and then two quarters. So this, you've got not just the coin, uh, the, the size and the, the, sort of the multiplicity in the individual changing places, but you've got a copper and silver items sort of clarifying the change. But I came back to this. I just like the presentation about the thing about, you know, everything seems to want to be something it's not. 50 cents wants to be 50 cents, and 50 cents wants to be 50 cents. I just sort of like that. Um, I have opened with this. I've never closed with it, because the ending, uh, I usually do in a walk-around situation, is actually in the pocket, which I'll show you right now. And it's a fine ending, but I don't think it's so... Hide me. Hide me. No, no, that's just the thing. Ooh. It's the sound of a, of a fireman taking a dump. Um, so you're here, you've got uh, this one here and this one here. Along with uh, the uh, half dollar and the two quarters, you're going to need another half dollar. Uh, I have done this where I've borrowed these two, which is nice, because then the idea is, of course, you just introduce the one half dollar, maybe do a shovel pass or something just to show how you only got the one coin, um, and then you borrow the two quarters and you go from there, which is nice too. Um, so 
Let's walk through the handling. I've got my two quarters here. I've got my half dollar there. Uh, I try to change up the handling for sure. In this case, I show the half dollar, do a, uh, sort of a transfer over here, put it back. Now this is great if you do it in people's hands. One in one hand, one in the other, and as you go along, they ask them to keep their hands wider and wider. You'll see because it's all thumb tip, it's all thumb tip uh, work, uh, dropping it back into people's hands is perfectly natural if there's not a table. Take the first quarter, show it, apparently put it in the other hand. I'm just doing classic palm, okay? You can either show it here, uh, maybe do a false transfer and put it in the classic palm. Okay, I'm just doing an upside down sort of retention. Or you can go from classic palm into the hand, or you can go from finger palm into the hand. Some false transfer. You don't flash that half dollar. So that's the first one. This is pushed up into classic palm as I reach for the second quarter. Classic palming quarters is a pain in the butt. I'm telling you that right now. It's not fun, um, but uh, this is what the coin trick requires. I apparently put the coin in the hand, and they hear the sound of the coin going in there. But all I'm doing is taking this quarter and pushing it up into classic palm while putting my hand in. Okay, so that's where the sound comes from, the second coin. I keep the quarters there, the half dollar here just to squeeze, and I'm going to push this. I kind of make sure those are sturdy. I make sure there's no noise by holding the quarters with my fingers as I push this up into the thumb palm. So this is going right in the thumb palm. Squeeze. Having just shown the half dollar here, now I open my hand. Finger to time, letting that fall, show that half dollar. And finger to time, letting those fall quarters. Little tip for you. Don't open this hand wide and then this hand holding the thumb palm. Instead, open this hand with your left thumb as if it's holding the thumb palm. And then like that. Now you don't become the, the amphibian boy. You don't, you don't, you just go boom, drop, boom, drop. So that's the first phase. Second phase uses a bobo switch. I transfer from classic palm to finger tip, uh, sorry, from classic palm to finger palm, just while gesturing from here to here. Pick up the quarter and do a bobo switch. Tossing, uh, actually the 50 cent piece goes in and the quarter is held back, okay? Here's one quick look at the bobo where you toss the coin and you pull this back into the finger palm. Okay. Boom, uh, then push it up into classic palm as I once again apparently put it in, but the click comes from both coins going in the hand. And again, thumb palm this one, boom, show the chance for it to happen a second time. Now, when I performed this uh, during our, our late night jam, I just uh, did a transfer off the end of the table. I did a false, let the extra half dollar fall on, uh, onto the floor. But that's a rare situation. Normally I'll be doing this walk around standing up, frankly. So in that situation, what I do is this. I'm left with this here. Uh, what I'll do at this point is simply pick up the two quarters and say, let's try that one last time. But this time we'll isolate the hands even more. I'll take the quarters, and I apparently put the quarters in my right hand. I do the most casual false transfer I know. And that is that I just let the two coins fall right into the fingers, palm. They fall from classic, basically on the palm, right to the fingers. And the key to this is not so much the particulars of the hand, but the attitude in which you do it. Really casual. So I picked up these two quarters, show them, false transfer, real casual. Pick up this and say, I said them even further. And as I close this into a fist, I actually push the half dollar to the back of my hand. So it's now at the back of my hand. I isolate them even further. I'll hold them not only three feet apart, but I'll keep this one in my fist. I'll keep it in my pocket. The only way you can make putting your hand in your damn pocket work theatrically is to make sure that there is no movement once it's inside the pocket. Okay? Which is why if you push the coin to the back of the fist, when I put my hand in my pocket, I can literally put it in, make sure, just put it in a little bit, get a squeeze here, immediately take it out. There's a real sense that I've never opened a hand, never changed anything, and now I can show the quarters here and the half dollar here. One last point is notice on this last one, they saw the half dollar here, but then when I put it out, I didn't open this hand first. Why? Because I want to distance myself from the moment in the pocket as much as possible. So I want to end the effect, not with the hand that just came out of the pocket, so they go, just came out and they go back to the pocket. I want to end the effect with the hand that never came near the pocket. So even though the other times I, I open it in the reverse order, this time I do this, come forward, so now I've got two coins here, bring all focus back here, boom like that. And if I borrow these quarters, which is always nice, give those back, and at that point I can go into, uh, if I finger palm like a ketchup packet from the back of my hand, and it's got a little hole, I can take the coin, jam it up my nose, and then have blood shoot down. <laughs> Right there and take out any card. I got one right here, my friend. Take it out. Mm -hmm. and